Okay, welcome to the Mining Pod. We've got a news roundup. we got an extra guest bumping along with us today, Charlie Spears. Welcome to the podcast. Also, Matt Kimmel, less notable since you're here every week, but we still love you. Uh, we got a few different conversation points today about mining news, and then at the end, we will talk about Ordinal's thing that has come to save Bitcoin block space. And that's why we got Charlie uh, Ordinal's OG on our conversation today. So welcome both to the pod. Glad to be Thanks here. being here, Charlie. Yeah. yeah. Well, love you guys. This is awesome. There we go. There we go. This is good. Okay. So we have a few points of conversation for those listening in terms of mining news. Uh, the both of our guests, Matt and Charlie, are agitated and ready to talk about ordinals. And perhaps we'll have very limited to say about the mining news. That is okay. Uh, we still got the headlines for you. Uh, we're going to talk about Kazakh mining. There's been some new information about how they're going to limit the amount of energy usage that Bitcoin miners can use within the Central Asian country. Uh, we're also going to talk about Argo blockchain CEO Peter Wall resigning. Uh, touch on that for just a moment. And then lastly, we'll talk about SEC and staking, which came out yesterday. Actually, we should just start there. The staking news is really big. So yesterday, the SEC settled or announced a settlement with Kraken, the US-based crypto exchange. And that Kraken is shutting down US uh, availability for its staking protocol, notably Ethereum, uh, but there's a lot of other projects that you're able to stake with on Kraken. It'll still be available internationally. Charlie, what throws one to you since you were a former Ethereum miner and possibly a staker right now? I don't know. What was your take on this news? I don't have anything staked, uh, but yeah, we were a large Ethereum miner. I am constantly amazed by the decisions of the SEC. Um, and I think they're not uh, not really acting in the interest of uh, uh, providing clarity to the industry and to American residents. So um, who knows what comes next? Like what, what options do these exchanges have? Uh, you can't unstake your ETH. It's pretty tough. I know that the, the announcement from Kraken did say that they are going to continue staking ETH until the Shanghai upgrade. For those who are not familiar with the Ethereum ecosystem, the Shanghai upgrade is going to allow Ethereum stakers to withdraw all their funds. So when that occurs, uh, Kraken will basically auto withdraw everyone's funds and send them back to their wallets. But as of right now, if you're staking something else on Kraken, you are not staking anymore because of this settlement. Matt, I'll get your take on it though. A lot of people on crypto Twitter are pretty frustrated with this and Coinbase notably is also in line of fire here, right? Because they have a very large staking program. Yeah, I think that the SEC and, and really like government agencies more broadly kind of felt behind the eight ball as far as um, their kind of control over the crypto industry. Um, and so because of FTX, I think like the scrutiny is kind of coming and like the, the governance kind of reach over crypto broadly is probably going to inch along throughout this year. Um, I mean, what it means for crypto broadly probably uh, a little bullish for some of the staking services that are kind of more decentralized um, and outside of the states, maybe bullish for some VPN services out there. I don't know. Um, it's kind of yet to be seen, but I would expect kind of the regulatory crackdown to continue. I, I love what you said there. Uh, I think the thing to watch here is what happens with Coinbase because they do have a very large staking presence. Uh, they, they are actually saying that their staking offering is substantially different from what Kraken offers. And so they don't think they're going to be impacted by this. That being said, Coinbase shares did drop on the news by quite a bit, I think like 10% plus yesterday, because about 11% of Coinbase's revenue is actually derived from their staking system right now. That's according to like their Q4 numbers. So definitely something to watch because this is like a material difference for their balance sheet, right? And also there's that huge fine that was levied by the SEC is a $30 million fine. Looking at the fine, that is something that really caught my eye, a $30 million fine. That's compared to what OFAC, I believe is OFAC, fined, or perhaps is DOJ, fined Kraken for operating with Iranian users. And that was about two years ago that that occurred. Right? So like they're fining people more for offering unreg unregistered securities, quote unquote, to US residents than they were for Kraken offering services to a rogue regime. Uh, just something that's a little... A little out there. Uh, unless, Charlie, you have anything more to say on that, we can turn to the next headline. Let's talk about Kazakh mining, which we haven't really given any airtime to for a while. There hasn't been too much going on there. Uh, but according to new reports from Coindesk, 
the president of Kazakhstan has signed into legislation law that will limit the energy use by domestic crypto miners, according to a statement posted on the president's website. Basically, what's happening here is that any crypto miner is now allowed to only use the excess capacity from the energy markets, the national grid. Any miner who is plugged into off-grid sources is basically okay. They can keep operating as they want to because it's their energy. But if you're connected to the national grid, you can only mine Bitcoin with whatever is extra. And there isn't a lot of extra from my understanding of the region, right? Because they always have these energy power outs and disputes. One little tag on here before I throw it to you guys. Interesting tidbit about this is that a part of this legislation added that 75% of the Bitcoin mined from Kazakh miners must be sold into uh, regulated crypto exchanges that are regulated by the Kazakh government. So you're starting to see like this uh, nationalization of the mining industry in Kazakhstan, right? They have regulation on energy, they have regulation on where you can sell. I'm sure there's more to come in the future. Matt, I'll throw it down to you first. So Charlie, definitely want to get your take on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like this is kind of a long time coming, but um, like if you think back to the China ban in 2021, there was like a lot of talk of where are the miners going to go. And I think a lot of them ended up in Kazakhstan for the cheap energy and like the closest proximity to China. Well, a lot of people went to the U.S., a lot of people went to Kazakhstan. And I mean, it seems like in retrospect, it was kind of a better idea to come over to the U.S., like looking back now um, with kind of like the the ease of um, kind of welcoming of, of regulation, especially in Texas, even though it's kind of a state by state, state by state thing uh, in the U.S. So I don't know. Interesting story. Yep, I'm a native Texan. I'll keep shilling Texas on the pod. And I'm not sorry about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to echo Matt. If you roll the clock back two years ago, that's pre-China ban? No, two and a half years ago. Um, it it was, on, no one could ever fathom we'd be in this this situation. Um, I do, yeah, the, the subject of like that miners have to liquidate their Bitcoin on a Kazakh regulated entity or Kazakh entity is, is probably more interesting to me because I, you know, we kind of, I probably say we could anticipate that the government would try to capture the mining industry, but um, that might have some interesting dynamics for local Bitcoin price. I, I have no idea. Look at what's happening in um, Nigeria. Yeah, I think it's a good point. It's something definitely to watch. Uh, it's kind of like a weird rule I wouldn't have thought of, but it makes sense if you're really trying to nationalize an industry. Uh, my understanding is that the amount of Kazakh hash rate on uh, on the network has like dropped by like fifty percent or something like that. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's been a substantial drop since a lot of this regulation has come into being over the last year or two. Maybe, maybe there'll be a Kazakh discount on the Bitcoin price. I wonder if yeah, and Bankman Freed is out there listening and he wants to start the future. A not this. The future Bankman Freeds are crafting their their savior narrative at this very moment. <laughs> yeah, because I can't wait to steer away from that. Okay, let's talk about Argo blockchain. Uh, we don't like covering these sort of news items, but it is important to the industry when executives do depart firms, especially the public miners. So last week, we talked about Chad Everett Harris departing uh, Riot. We also talked about BitFarm CEO resigning in December. And now Argo blockchain's CEO has resigned. It's Peter Wall. He was at the firm for about five years. I believe he was a co-founder as well. And then he was the CEO the last three years. Argo Blockchain, as we've discussed on this podcast, a mining memo, like a solid miner in terms of like getting hash rate online, things like that. But their debt profile was really bad. Uh, they diluted a lot in 2021 and they had to take on debt in 2022 because wasn't much room for further dilution and they had a lot of bills to pay. Uh, and so I think this is just like them wanting to change helm a little bit. Peter did uh, organize and execute on a great plan with Galaxy Digital to sell their Helios facility in Texas to Galaxy Digital. Uh, it seemed to put uh, Argo back in pace, back into a good place for it to continue expanding and growing. Uh, really able to save the firm from Chapter 11. That being said, they seem to want a different leadership at the time or uh, Peter maybe is ready to look on to, to a new project as of right now with his resignation. So we don't have a lot of details, but something definitely to cover charlie throw it to you well yeah peter's kind of he's steered that ship for a while um we've had it's the second kind of more notable resignation or departure 
it's not an easy time to be a Bitcoin miner. Um, some people, you know, there's a multitude of reasons and I won't really speculate, but I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, five years is a long time in this business and um, you, maybe you, maybe you uh, just don't want to steer that big of a ship anymore. Who knows? I guess like another one bites the dust, I guess. I mean, in the, in the down markets, I think a lot of people kind of reassess their situation and consider, are, are you doing what you want to be doing? Um, and I guess Peter's made the call to, to go do something else. I hope the best for him. And, you know, Argo, you, you still got a, about a year and a little bit uh, up until the halving. Maybe you get some new management and you make some new decisions and um, the ship goes into a new direction. So we'll see what happens. Definitely. Uh, one thing I want to bring up is the culture in crypto to swap jobs pretty quickly, right? It's not uncommon to see people move to a different job and industry within two to three years. And it gets a little tricky, though, when you're an executive, right? Because like you need to see that uh, entire project through. But still, sometimes I think that people do swap jobs pretty easily anyways, because the, the industry is so friendly to people transitioning from place to place, regardless of your position. But we will close down that topic. Thanks for the news roundup, you guys. We are now going to talk about ordinals, which you guys... Yeah, there we go. If you're listening, both our hands just win the air. We're so excited. <laughs> uh, I honestly don't even have like a first question for this, Charlie. I guess you're. you're the- I'll throw it at you. I'll throw it at you. I'll throw it at you. Like it, it is. It's happened very quickly. Yeah. Um. I mean, what do you even know? What do I know about ordinals? How do you? How do you? You yeah, is a mining podcast. This is kind of on. This is something that came out of left field. That's true. Where do you? How do you even ask? How do you, as a researcher, even go about asking these questions? So it's a bit mm. rhetorical. Mm. Um, mm. Good questions. Well, we did do a nice podcast last week, uh, Matt, or it's two weeks ago now. Matt walked me through ordinals, went through all the information about it, uh, even corrected some misconceptions I had, uh, which don't love being corrected, but needed to happen. And so I feel like I'm pretty up to speed on it. If anyone's listening to ordinals, Definitely go check out that podcast. Charlie, I know you've done a few things on it. Uh, we also have some stuff from like uh, Casey Rodemore. Is Rodemore his last name, right? Yeah, Rod- Rodemore. Yeah, Rodemore. Uh, Casey's done a few different podcasts. So definitely jo- go check out those uh, little media links. It'll be helpful. Yeah. But like, why are you a Bitcoin park? Like, what's going on? Yeah. What's going on there? <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. I'll, how, about, how about we talk about how I even got here? So I'm in Nashville. I, I live in Oklahoma. I have a mining business do some off-grid mining in oklahoma come from oil and gas i've always you know been a bitcoin enthusiast i've always enjoyed outsider uh things that happened to bitcoin so um a month ago i was here in nashville um to visit there was a little conference with some miners very cool and i plan on coming back the week after that i uh this one podcast that i was kind of a fan of uh, released to mainnet where one of the guys on it released to mainnet this client which helped you inscribe things to the Bitcoin blockchain so I start hopping in the discord which for Bitcoiners uh, discord as a communication medium is not uh, as popular We're more of a telegram crowd I have am native discord so it felt oh this is a place I can go hang out so um, that is where I started chatting just with a with Casey and his junior dev and a couple of his friends for a while and you know as maybe the first hundred people came in you know helped set up some of the kind of community management tools tweeted about it inscribed some things wrapped my head around it um and then as you know about two weeks ago all hell broke loose and I found myself um you know, calling my my Bitcoin mining company partners and saying, guys, can you just kind of pause like any things you need from me for like a little while? Because I have to go do my true calling, which is be a Discord mod. And um, so I found myself kind of in this informal volunteer. I want to be clear. There's it's like not even super clear what. Oh, we know you're going to stacks from this, man. <laughs> in all oh. the rare Satoshis. Inscriptions oh. are a funding mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Uh, I, yeah, I, uh, I found myself, uh, informally and somewhat of like a communications community manager role, which is not something I ever anticipated. So, um, I just happened to have been a little bit early to the game and enthusiastic. And then, um, uh, I'm, I had already planned on coming to Nashville where 
AC has been hanging out. He's giving a workshop tomorrow. Um, this workshop was already planned a month ago. And I was like, oh, I should probably go to this. And now I realize I kind of have to go to this because we have to, um, I don't know when this podcast will drop, but um, a lot of this is up in the air. Um, again, it's really just kind of Casey's wild idea that he came up with was talking to a bunch of people and then he shipped something it is like the return to the days of that one coder in a garage or a bedroom uh single-handedly uh changing what um deep pocketed venture capital has tried to do for a long time so it's kind of a bit of a renaissance mm. Mm. i love that and matt you've met casey so you're also familiar with the idea of him you're an og as well right I don't know if I'd call myself an OG, but I met I met Casey chapter. briefly at the uh, at the Bitcoin Plus Plus conference. I don't even know how long it was ago it was. It was definitely last year. I think it was early, uh, maybe Q one. And he was just talking about ordinals, and it was really just about the kind of numerical accounting scheme of it, right? Because what um, I like to think about ordinals like itself, like not inscriptions, is kind of putting on kaleidoscope glasses and looking at Bitcoin. Um, you basically see like these these units are actually fungible in and of themselves, like fundamentally, right? But what you're doing is you're just seeing it in a different way. And you're seeing it in basically these uniquely fragmented pieces across a number line from one to 21 quadrillion. Um, and the, like the inscription part of it kind of came after I first heard, heard about ordinals. Um, and that's, I think really like the elegant kind of genius part of this, um, is to basically say, Hey, I got a content file, um, and I'm actually going to attach it to this individual Satoshi. I don't know for, for me, I, I feel like I'm, I'm back in, uh, 2012 and counterparty just started. And there's like all this buzz about putting data on chain. And like, as you know, what in my heart of hearts as a Bitcoiner, I know that like long term putting a bunch of data on chain is kind of like antithetical to people wanting to um, run full nodes, right? There's higher storage costs, et cetera. But this is completely within the rules, right? Uh, each block is kind of, you know, it's limited to, uh, you know, a size of four megabytes. And all the inscript inscribers are doing is basically using this block space and they are paying for it. Um, one of the gripes I have, like looking around the community is that people say that these are like illegitimate transactions. Um, I, I don't really feel like that's fair to say. Uh, I, a lot of people come from like the, the Austrian camp of um, subjective value. So who's to say one transaction is, is more important than another? And it's not necessarily a free rider problem because people are paying economic fees and miners are accepting them to put this information into blocks. The fun part about this that I think is is really encouraging is all of the new people that are coming to Bitcoin, right? I think uh, it's it's piqued people's interest, especially from the NFT community on other chains, um, and people are kind of coming for the art. But I I, I I'm hoping, right, that that people will kind of stay for the superior money of Bitcoin, right? that that will be the the end result of this. We'll have more people joining um, the network to make Bitcoin more fault tolerant. Um, and then people will kind of discover the the properties and investment potential of uh, Bitcoin the asset. I think there's all sorts of interesting conversations that can come of inscriptions and, you know, the long-term potential effects of it, um, which like I would be curious to hear, hear Charlie's thoughts, of course. Um, but that's kind of my my initial take. Yeah, I'll I'll also reprise kind of what you said. I think most of people who are looking at it before it blew up in the in the main narrative was was those of us who are more interested in the what you would call ordinal theory. I got very interested in the numbering of specific satoshis, um, with a you know a bit of a interest in numerology thrown in there as well. So like that's what interested me and. Um, it's as is the case with a lot of these things, the killer app or kind of the the driver of interest happens to be um, one kind of application which Casey had actually built out pretty well. Um, it's not it's not simple. It's not easy to inscribe. It requires some command line and a uh, full Bitcoin node. But um, like the fact that uh, you can immediately copy the NFT culture and mindset onto Bitcoin allows. Um, a lot of those people to immediately apply and try to discover value on the Bitcoin blockchain. 
I'm telling you, Matt, I'm, I'm here with you. Like, um, uh, there's a lot of discussion and, um, I would say histrionics even about like what this could mean for Bitcoin. Um, and I will probably not, I'll probably only speculate, but not really give too strong opinions on that because I'm really just too busy helping NFT kids like download and run Bitcoin core. Like that is what gives me life. I've been trying to do this for a decade. And, um, so I'm not going to look this gift horse in the mouth. I love that. Okay. I want to throw it back to you, uh, Charlie. I was listening to a Twitter spaces last night and it wasn't very informative, but I did feel a lot of enthusiasm in the room from a lot of NFT people. And I want to sift through the hype a little bit and understand like, what are the differences between Ethereum NFT and Bitcoin ordinals? How should we understand this for someone who's walking in and might know a little bit about Ethereum NFTs? Yeah, I'll probably echo what, what Casey said for a lot. Inscriptions are as a subset of digital artifact, um, which have a which have unique properties, which are probably what the spiritual like that's what the actual meaning or what people had in their heads when they thought of what a non fungible token is. Um, it's something which is inscribed and immutable and also on chain. That's not the case for other blockchains, and that's what. That's kind of what Bitcoiners have always said. Like a lot of us have said, um, those of us who look at the NFT world are like, um, some of us think it's cool, some of us hate it, but um, a lot of people have said that'll that'll come to Bitcoin or like those aren't, there's not really like a whole lot of meaning to it because you can alter the Ethereum contract. It's a reference. You don't own that profile pic. Um, you actually do in Bitcoin. And that surety uh, is going to be bootstrapped in ways and leveraged in ways we don't really understand yet. So I'm very bullish on it. I'm agnostic to the direction it goes. So the, I think the coolest part of uh, inscriptions is that it like borrows some scarcity from uh, Bitcoin block space. There can only be as many as like the at most, the absolute most amount of inscriptions that can be added is... Um, how many content files can fit into a four megabyte block approximately every 10 minutes. And I think that's a really unique thing. Um, I also want to add a, a tidbit and speculate that I think eventually, perhaps, NFT communities may actually change their reference file instead of pointing to IPFS or AWS and point it to an inscription on chain. So I think there's a potential for these things to kind of like come together. Mm. But... That's just, I'm just, just throwing a teaser. I think it could happen. Yeah. Because the same, like it, NFTs on Bitcoin of, of old, like rare Pepe's, right. Which, which like have a strong community and like, it's really interesting there. Those are reference files as well, I believe. Um, so inscriptions have much stronger property rights as the data, like the, the, the database is the chain in and of itself. The talk right now is like all these. Uh, you know, 10K profile pick collections on Ethereum or whatever, um, maybe moving or migrating to Bitcoin. Who knows how that goes? Maybe they end up just referencing Bitcoin. I, I don't really know. Um, it's so early. I, I mean, just to clarify, like you have to download, or, you know, the org client from GitHub, which is already a website which most NFT people have never been to. And um, you have to follow a guide and you have to run a full node. It's kind of expensive to run a full node, uh, just because you gotta. Well, I mean, buy a hundred dollars um, to to get your hard drive. Um, it's also really funny because typically, when you ever you sync a, a full Bitcoin node, you're not like desperate for it to happen. It kind of syncs on its own timeline. But um, now everybody and their dog is counting down the days and learning about you know sync speeds of of hard drives and and uh, learning about you know how fast your the peers you connect to can can communicate so uh we have we have gone from zero to a hundred in the matter of two weeks as far as like uh the world of people in the creator blockchain economy if you will already going down the rabbit hole of like how do utxos work i mean because they got to solve those problems if you you it's it is hard to inscribe if you have uh no t utxos to to broadcast and, and a step further sat selection which is like wild right a lot of Bitcoiners that uh, haven't even really gotten into the topic of uh, of coin selection. I'll, I'll add, I was trying to run some numbers earlier today. 
that I think the the inscription total we're recording on the the tenth of February is getting close to fifty thousand inscriptions. Um, and the amount that's being inscribed on chain each day is like doubling. Of course, it's not sustainable, right? Because again, block space is limited. But it's and the the total transaction size of such things is almost a full gigabyte. Um, the, so the demand of this is basically proven by the market, right? People are willing to pay transaction fees for this, and even further to Charlie's point, run full nodes. How cool is that? I got another question for you guys. Where does this go? Like, what are the things we should be paying attention to next? I'm hearing chatter about uh, inscription marketplaces and learning how to like make these things more tradable. Uh, obviously, there's no open CE for inscriptions yet. But oh, well, I don't know if that was a I don't know if that was a layup. I will have to shield that I'm working on a side project, ordinalhub.com, which mm. purports to try to do some of those things ordinalhub.com where do i send my sunday ground check <laughs> uh i go uh cv spears inscription so uh, okay okay you know, i've inscribed okay. in at you know, it's an address so you can send your seed round check to that inscription address that's good to know okay cool well for those listening to the podcast we are diligently working on our own inscription we're doing a limited edition nft run crucify me i'm gonna say nft i think everyone's gonna say bitcoin nfts i'm sorry that's just what's going to happen i think i'll die on the inscription hill i will die on this hill i, th I think right. I, bad NFT. semantics will nft is just too popular i around sorry like, the google analytics are off the chart so even like your i've noticed descriptions aren't tokens i've noticed the language changing and i think through sheer force of will and we can prove that we can change the sad to rich thing all over again i just i, I just oh. I can't do it i can't do it but you're right. I'm not saying you're not right. I'm just saying that in the long term, you're also wrong. Oh, is that? Well, yeah. Yeah. It's okay, though. Anyways, we are doing a uh, limited edition inscription for the mining pod. So if you do want one of these, email us at media at compassmining.io. If you're one of the first people to reach out to us, he will indeed get one of these. But any other thoughts from Charlie and Matt before we close out? Yeah. They're... Um... There is no like uh, convention for how these things are traded. There is no consensus on it. This, these are there's no permissionless swaps right now. So um, if you want to buy and sell inscriptions, like um, best of luck. You got to hop in some discords and you've got to learn real fast um, what it means to be rugged over a Discord DM. That means there's huge market opportunity. <clears throat> it's kind of like like NFTs have been a thing on Ethereum for a long time. But the, the tooling built out to really kick off the 2021 NFT run, as we think about it, didn't happen until years into this. So um, we could be looking at a similar situation for inscriptions. Um, I will say, though, that the ordinal team, if we want to use that term, has uh, permissionless swaps within the org client as the absolute number one priority, because that's one of the prerequisites to get out uh, so to just to reduce the amount of people uh, getting uh, rugged by stuff. Hmm. No rugging. I'll uh, I'll echo that and say NFTs were um really popular as first as an idea back in 2017 with CryptoKitties on Ethereum, um. But until OpenSea, I think it was like December 2020, it was like, hey, you can come mint here for free, and we have this really easy tooling process. Did it really kind of kick off the boom of of NFTs? All right, my last word, I guess, is is kind of to to push back, and we've been really excited about uh, inscriptions and and ordinals this conversation. Um, but I think some of the challenges of op return protocols um, kind of working on, on Bitcoin in and of itself uh, are still kind of there with inscriptions. So if you have a marketplace that's on chain, right, you still are limited by the 10 minute block time and you're still competing with other types of transactions in the fee market. And so it poses the question is kind of the, the marginal utility of minting and trading um, an inscription, right, is that at the same level of the, the utility of sending a financial transaction on Bitcoin. And I think that's yet to be known and we'll kind of see that uh, play out like uh, uh, over time. Um, my, my intuition is that the time sensitivity of kind of inscribing the SAT is not the same as if, if you're wanting to send a, uh, a financial transaction. Um, and so there, there's kind of some, some potential like buyer of, buyer of last resort for block space, I think. Um, is, a, is a term people are throwing out there. 
But I definitely think there will be kind of tensions where if I want to make a trade, I mean, I'm using a marketplace um, and I send a, a, a transaction, it, it's not necessarily going to be instant. Like if you're sending something on Lightning or really as fast as if you're doing something on say Solana. There's, comp there's trade offs to these platforms. And I think Bitcoin and inscriptions give you the strongest property rights, but it may not be the best user experience. But Charlie, it sounds like you might be, uh, might be trying to fix that and, and may maybe uh, have some thoughts against my points there. So I'm excited to see what you come up with. We'll see. I have, a, I have an obligation to running my, run my existing business, but, um, and I am a volunteer and enthusiast and associated with uh, kind of helping propagate and keep the wheels on the bus of this whole inscriptions thing right now. Um, I'll just think, I'll, I'll, you know, end with this. Like, um, I've been through several cycles and it gets really lonely and really uh, kind of just depressing at the bottom. And this is the first time I've seen like optimism sweep through the Bitcoin uh, space. And so... Um, I've less, I've always kind of tried to have the voice of encouraging optimism and creativity and less of circling the wagons and being hostile. Um, so I, uh, I'm a big tent Bitcoiner and I want to encourage new people coming in. And so that's the voice I always want to have. Love that. And I'm totally there with you, which is why I should coin here and there. Uh, but we will end there. Charlie and Matt, thank you so much for joining the mining pod. For those listening, please give us a subscription on YouTube or give us a five-star rating on your preferred podcast platform of choice. And again, if you want an inscription, send us an email at media at compassmining.io. Again, Charlie, Matt, thanks for your time. We'll see you guys again soon.